of, of uh, September. We have a guest speaker, uh, Kath Lyon, Lyon Mom, and Kath is, uh, is going to talk to us about the old bakery, and also uh, she's brought along another one of her uh, partners, I think Anne is uh, part of the business as well, and also Andrew who's restoring the oven and is going, and Andrew's the baker who's going to produce bread from the old bakery here, it sounds terrific. Now, Andrew's brought along his wife, sorry, Emma, Emma, Emma and the little one as well. So, lovely to have you all here as a group, and Kath, if you'd like to come and uh, give us your, your talk tonight, that'll, that'll be great. So, Kath, I'd like to introduce Kath Lyman. Thank you, Kat. Thank you. Lovely to meet me, everyone. Uh, it's lovely to be here. I've often heard about the Historical Society, but now I've met some of you, so I'm, I know a little bit more about you, and, and I have met you in the gallery, of course, as well. Um, the, our story with the old bakery began in 1995. Um, we were looking, a group of us, of friends, were looking for somewhere to invest a little bit of money and uh, led by Anne, who's at the back, who's a, a great renovator. She's renovated old houses and, you know, got us enthusiastic and she found the old bakery and we all immediately all fell in love with this um, building. Although at the time, um, it was fairly difficult to see just what we were going to be buying because it was in fairly bad state of repair once we looked at it, but it was stacked from floor to ceiling with um, shelving and clothing and materials and great big industrial sewing machines and all sorts of things. So it wasn't until after we purchased it we really found out that we had bought, but we've been delighted with that um, building. The, uh, there were originally four partners, um, and Uterac at the back, Rosemary Kant, who uh, was unfortunately unable to come tonight, uh, myself, and Joe Barry. Um, and I'm going to be relying very heavily tonight on what I'm saying from research that Joe Barry did uh, just after we bought the building. Um, Joe is no longer a partner uh, with us, but the other three of us have stayed with it for the last 15 years, so we, we know Maylands pretty well now and uh, we feel very much part of the community. Um, we're delighted also, and we'll uh, get Andrew to come and talk a little bit later, so we're in, delighted to be able to sort of say, well, this is what it was like, this is where we've been with it, and this could be the future, part of the future of the building, and it'll still be very much part of the community, which uh, we read the histories, uh, that's very much, uh, that's what it was. Um, we've thought, it wasn't just the building, but the building in Maylands, we thought Maylands was a suburb that really had been neglected, overlooked, shall we say, rather than neglected. Close to the city, beautiful parks and uh, around the uh, river, as you all know, mm -hmm. and very much underrated. And it's great to see that things are moving now, that other people are discovering it although we don't want everybody to just go back to keep something to ourselves. Um, so, Joe did some research by um, going to the uh, man's department, I think it was, and so on, and got a little bit of the history, the background of the, the area and the building, and I'll just read a little bit from this. The land on which the present building stands was part of an original grant made in 1833 to John Gregory for a parcel of land consisting of 806 acres. For this land he paid an annual rent of one peppercorn. I've never really discovered what one peppercorn is, <laughs> but it seems to come. Oh, <laughs> Very tiny. Okay. Um, in 1886, the land passed to Charles Dallas Alexander of Perth and subsequently to John James Slade of Sydney. The land was transferred to the Sydney and Perth Land Building and Investment Company Limited in 1892, so it's had quite a few different owners. An area of the land was set aside for the Eastern Railway under the Railways Act of 1878, and the remainder of the land was then made into smaller lots, a 
the large area of pass to gold and sacks and stables. The area bordered by railway tours, 8th Avenue, 9th Avenue and Guildford Road was divided into a number of smaller lots and lot 31 was sold to Asher Solomon of Maylands in, in 1903. So that's the lot that the uh, bakery is on. The shop was then built along with the bakery. We don't know exactly when the shop was built, but we, we believe it was very soon after 1903, and later a house was added. Then in 1928, uh, sorry, 1922, the property was sold to George Friedrich Rosbach of Kathleen Avenue, Maylands. Now the Rosbach family uh, were well known, became well known, um, as some of the original bakers here. Uh, George came from Germany in 1914, so a fairly difficult time for a German migrant to arrive in Australia, just the beginning of the First World War. We don't know much about uh, what happened in between there, but in 19... Let me see, where are we? Um, in 1920... To, he did buy the building, and we have some of the history that came from um, one of his grandsons who still lives in Maylands. We have a picture of the Rostock family in 1939. Uh, again, difficult time for German uh, migrants in Australia. Um, celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary, um, to, uh, two daughters and their son Werner uh, two of the the, one of the daughters and Werner both worked in the bakery with their father at different times. Although Werner went on to study to be an engineer in um, Germany, he went back to Germany to do that and came back in 1939. Again, a very difficult time. Thank you. So George was a baker from 1922 until the war and when he and Werner were interned. Move that over. Oh, okay. That might just work that way. Good. Okay. And you can all have a closer look at this later. Oops. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so George was the baker from 1922 to the 1940s when um, he and his son were interned on Rotness. Now, uh, at that time, um, there was a lot of, quite a lot of antagonism towards German migrants, of course, and, um, but there, a lot of the community, community were quite concerned because they had been very much part of the community and were well liked. Um, and so there was, you know, sort of um, quite a lot of concern about what was happening at that time, but of course with the war uh, and everything that was happening worldwide. Uh, it was a, a difficult time for them. So he stopped being the baker there, but he still owned the building. <laughs> and from there we find a lot of this information, by the way, that Joe uh, got together was after we bought the building, um, we had cleaned it up a little bit and were wondering what we were exactly going to do with it. And we put an advertisement in the paper to see if anyone could tell us any of the history because we were all interested in the history of the building. And we, I think we had 74 replies. So we were very impressed by that. And we invited everybody to come and have a morning tea in the old bakery. And that was great because they shared stories. They met people that they hadn't known or hadn't seen since they'd all gone to school together in Maylands and so on. And there were lots of stories about the bakery and, and how, I know I remember one chap saying he worked in the wood yard that had been across the road and he'd earn his sixpence and come in and buy second uh, day old cakes from the, from the bakery with his sixpence on Saturdays and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and we learnt a lot of the history of the area from there. So that was a really interesting thing that, that happened. And I find that when I'm working in the gallery that Weekly, every week, I've got somebody who comes in and s tells me a story about the old bakery. And having the old oven still available at the, at the back was a great thing because people were very interested and would often go down and have a look and, and so on. 
and tell us more stories about what happened to them, how their experience of, of the area. Now, after uh, George went to, was interned on Rotnest, um, he leased the bakery, and we picked up a little bit of that information. Um, there were several different bakers' names came forward. Um, there were the Globes and the Guys and Tom Cameron and later um, a Clem Desham. So Tom Cameron came in about 1942 and I'm going to read from uh, his memoirs that he, he gave to him, he wrote for his son uh, before he died, and some of it refers to the old bakery. So he had been a baker somewhere else, and it was apparently in a, in a really bad building, and the water used to come up underneath it, and it was you know, not the best place. So, but somebody found the old bakery in 8th Avenue, which at the time wasn't being used because George was, had been returned. Um, and it's interesting, a sign of the times. He says, the mainland's place belonged to a Mr. Rostad, a German. I did not mind the fact that he was German, due to my very great respect for another German man that he knew. Um, and so that, that was interesting. Immediately there was that thought, he's a German, and, and it's the war, war time in the 1942. It was highly suspected that the bakehouse part of a shop and a spare room and a kitchen had broke. Andrew, do you know about rope? Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't be telling you this. No, that's fine. <laughs> a lot of bakeries in that yard. It's a fungus that affected bread. Um, so he and a friend cleaned it with malt vinegar um, and painted the whole place. It was a much better place in many ways than the place he'd been in before. And it was nine by, and he had a shop to sell the retail that you hadn't had before. And it was nine miles close to Coles, our main customers, so presumably Coles in the city. Um, having by this time built up a fair sized business, it was necessary to put on a man to, to put on a man to help with the deliveries. And that man was Ronnie Jen Jenkins. A better man I could not have got. Ron worked hard, was punctual and polite, and everybody liked him. I don't know whether there's any one who knows of Ronnie Jenkins still or um, it was not an easy business to run, as the supply of ingredients to make the more profitable lines was almost non-existent. Again, remember it's wartime. Um, margarine was in very short supply, and what currants and sultanas we could get were used making the buns. We made buns and sponges in large quantities, and as we had dad's and my sugar ration, and flour was readily available, and so were the eggs from the incubator. So he, he talks about uh, the difficulties running that and, and how, how they had to deliver the bread and, and how hard he had to work, his wife wasn't very well, etc. Um, during the early part of 1947, a man named Le Clem Dishon, uh, who worked for one of the bigger bakeries, came and he asked him how we got such a nice bloom on all of our products. <coughs> And his wife wasn't going to give away the secrets. And uh, um, Tom Cameron said if he ever went into his own bakery, then he would give him the, the recipe for that. So, and apparently a few years later, this is what happened. Um, this condition came back, and uh, he actually bought the, the business from um, from Tom Cameron, and he was then given this recipe, which we've got here, if you're interested, <laughs> 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 um, But anyway, so that was uh, an interesting little thing there. The only real secret, though, to getting a good bread was hard work, and the more effort we put into baking, the better the product. That was Tom Cameron's story about the old bread. Um, it's interesting because Tom Cameron's granddaughter, granddaughter is one of the, our textile suppliers. She came in with some scarves and wraps one day and said, oh, I used to have this constant jam and cream sitting under the fire in that fireplace. <laughs> so we were 
that, which that was an interesting little coincidence there. Um, so the building was uh, leased as a bakery to several different oper operators. Um, and in 1968, the building was sold to Fernando Bonini. It was leased for a number of years as an antique dealer's. Oh, by the way, it would be after Tom Cameron uh, and Claire uh, uh, Desham, we had Ted Aldrich, and we have a photograph here of Ted Aldrich. Now, we had the earlier history that we had was that the, it stopped being a bakery in 1955, but um, Ted Aldrich's daughter came into the bakery a couple of weeks ago, and she said, you haven't got anything about my father there. Um, and I said, hang on, we haven't heard about your, your dad. And she, they emailed me a photograph, and he was there from 1966 to 1968 as a baker. And he was, I think, um, originally leasing it from the Rothschilds, and then they sold, sold it on. So, and so he's, there's a picture of him standing in front of the shop with the sign on it and things in the window there. So we were really pleased to have that because we haven't had any of the early photos of the shop that we would like to have had. Um, I'm caught up here now. So, in 1995, the building was sold. Oh, sorry. In um, so it was a real estate business and other short-term ventures spent um, and then was sold to Maria Magorio. Sorry, Melogio. Maria Melogio, and she was the lady that we bought the shop from. Uh, and she had a, a clothing business and a plant business in the building. So in 1995, we bought the building, and we didn't know quite what we were going to do with it at first, but we loved having it here in all the history, and we thought we would originally thought we'd just sit off, let, rent it out as offices, but we thought, no, it's too good for that. And somebody came up with the idea of running an art gallery, and we were all in, interested in art, and we wanted to encourage local artists and, uh, and so on. And so gradually it grew as an art gallery. To get to that point, um, we, we have quite a lot of photographs. And do you want to add anything about the restoration and what it was like? Because you were heavily involved with that. Um, you can have a look, we'll pass these around and you can have a look at what the building looked like. Do you want to add anything there? Just a curious uh, question. Was that uh, direct shop uh, library? Was that uh, bread from the shop, or did they have uh, a round which they used to force the salt in, and then they come back to the motor vehicle um, in that area? They, I haven't got any record, of course. Oh, um, Tom Cameron talks about an old ute. I think he called it Gertrude or something or other. Yes, and uh, that was that's it. And but also, it was from. The shop. <coughs> yeah, um, I know um, Inga used to ride a bicycle delivering bread as far as Balcata, somebody said. I mean, can you imagine riding the bikes in those era, in that era, <laughs> on the roads of that era, as far as that? Um, there were, and there was another bakery, uh, in the, uh, Bride's Bakery, in um, Watley Crescent, I think it was, and he was one of the informants who, whether we talked to, uh, and he talked about using horse and cart to deliver bread and, and so on, and how the horse would know exactly which houses to stop at and you know on the route and, and so forth. And next door to the old bakery was um, uh, Watts's, uh, Charlie Watts, who ran the, uh, a produce store, and he had lots of horses in the backyard apparently, and horse and cart to deliver things and, and so on. Of course, that's John K. Watts, his grandfather, I think it was. Um, his daughter, granddaughter often comes into the, to the gallery and tells the stories about growing up next door and, and playing, um, you know, the, the kids playing, the, the, with the Rostock kids and the, and the Watts kids playing together. And uh, she brought along a 96-year-old woman one day. Unfortunately, I, I haven't got a, a record of the name. I think I wrote it somewhere, but I'm not sure where. And she had actually lived in the, she wasn't, the bakery was still going, but they, uh, nobody was living in the house. And she raised six children in that house apparently at one stage. So, as, as I say, every day I get these little stories that come along about people who have connections with them. 
So, look, I'll just very quickly say that, as you can imagine, the building was in shocking repair. Um, a third of the floorboards in the front room had to be replaced. Uh, you'll see some of the before and after photos in that long uh, folder uh, that we put together. Uh, I think it was for the City of Bayswater at one stage, and the Heritage Crown, which at that stage we didn't get. But, uh, yeah, it had been sadly neglected. Um, we repaired every room just about. The only thing we didn't touch and we must have known was the oven. And you can see the in the right hand corner there. That's that's how it looked until about a month ago. And I think we should just move on to Andrew who has just transformed that oven to just look magnificent. But yeah, the building has taken a lot of slow looking after. Mm. So, Andrew, I think it's time to hand over to you to tell us about what the future of this particular bank will be. Well, thank you very much. Well, thanks for the opportunity tonight to come and talk about the, the restoration process that we're going through in, uh, in 42A, doesn't it? Um, I've been a baker for 18 years now. And I've worked in many different aspects of, of the industry. Um, I feel that our industry is, is going in the wrong direction and, and has been for a, a long period of time now. So everything is quicker and, and faster and, and such is life um, to this day. So uh, about 10 years ago I got the opportunity to work at New Norcia Bakeries in Mount Hawthorne um, using their, their old oven. Similar to the one we had in, in Maylands, uh, only twice the, twice the size. Um, during that time, I, I realised that we can make good bread to this day, and, and we can make it without using chemicals. Um, the, the bread that we made had uh, four, four main ingredients. It had sourdough culture, um, which is a wild yeast. It had a flour, water and salt. Um, then they would they'd put other added, additives to it. Uh, fruits and nuts and, and grains and stuff like that. Um, the bread that we buy from the supermarket nowadays has 13 ingredients. Five of them are natural and, and eight of them are chemicals. So the, the process to make a, a good loaf of bread um, with, with that amount of ingredients obviously takes a lot more time and, and our industry at the moment is not suited towards that. Um, so my story sort of starts around that period. I've, I've travelled um, quite a bit and, and been to a lot of bakeries. Every place I go, I'm, I'm looking at bakeries and, and stuff like that. Um, about two years ago, it'll be this January, I was driving with my children. Um, we live up in the hills up Mundiring Way. And we thought, I thought, let's go for a drive. We'd only just moved back to, to Perth after a, a holiday, uh, sorry, a, a period up in Broome. And I thought, let's have a drive to the city and see if there's any good bakeries along, along the eastern side. So we got to Midland, um, and there wasn't much, wasn't much in Midland, the Brumbies, Baker's Delight, those sort of, sort of places. Um, got to Bassendine, uh, got to Bayswater, and, and then we got to Maylands. And we've seen a couple of the bakeries on the, on the right-hand side, and then we're sort of walking up the street and we've seen Old Bakery and, um, and Gallery. So, uh, the gallery was actually shut at the time, um, but my daughters and, and I went out the back and had a cup of tea and I, I'd seen the ovens sitting there and I thought, well, I've seen the, this uh, building before um, and I was wondering whether the oven was still, still intact inside. So, um, a couple of weeks later we all took a bit of a trip in there and we ran into Kath and Anne in the, in the back room and um, they were conducting interviews at the time for a, a chef, so we see if we could come in and, and spoke to them and um, sort of approach them in, in, a, in a mild manner and said, would you be interested in, in starting it again? And they were umming and ahhing and, and maybe they said, well, let's put in a proposal and, and see, what, see what we think. So um, a couple of months later, we, we come up with a proposal to, to what we would like to do and how we would like to restore the oven um, back to its back to its natural, natural state, um, repair it. There's quite a bit of uh, structural work that we had to, to change on the oven. Um, and it's, it's sort of gone from there. So about um, probably three months ago, the, the room got sort of closed off 
uh, the back room, and from there um, the restoration process started. Our, our process has, has been a, a long one. Um, at the, the stage we're at now, um, we have replaced all the, the tiles in the floor. The floor tiles were um, very porous and, and a lot of them were broken. We re-leveled the, all the sand in the floor. Um, my father-in-law and, and myself, my father was a big bricklayer, he struggled to get, get into the fire, into the oven, but he got in there, he was very, very, very keen to, to get in and help. Um, so his, his help for that was, was fantastic. Um, so now it has a completely new level four with um, brand new fire bricks. Um, the whole face, um, you guys will see when you get a chance to come up later on, had, had mortar and, and plaster on, on one half of it. We, we pulled that back and basically discovered that the reason they put that plaster and mortar on was there was a massive big crack. Um, the place where that crack is, is is just above here and that's due to the heat from the, the firebox. Obviously that's your hottest part, part of the oven, um, getting up to 500, 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so once we once we taken that off, we sort of realised we had a lot more work to, to do. We thought it'd just be nice and clean, and we would continue on as as be. Uh, so what we had to do was basically knock the top the top section of the oven out, and it was all all freestanding. There was six different sections across the top of that that oven. Nothing was tied into the chimney. Um, nothing was tied into to the right hand side wall as well. So. We pulled the, the top layer off and, and basically redid, redid all the top using the, the original bricks um, that were suitable and we re, uh, resourced some, some other old uh, red bricks as well to, to make up the, the piece. Um, there's a bit of structural damage to the oven on the, on the right hand outer wall of the, the oven. This is obviously due to the, the firebox um, and the way these ovens are built um, is basically two, two structures. You have an internal structure and then you have an external structure above that. Um, the way they used to make them was they build, build your walls up on the outside um, and then you build an internal wall. Fill that internal wall with sand and then lay, lay your um, baking bricks, your fire bricks. From that stage they would build a, a massive mound of sand into that cavity and then put your, put your roof on. So that was all bricked down, and then they put mortar or concrete over the top, and then they dig that hole out from underneath from your door. Take all that sand back up on top, onto your, the top of your oven, to your roof as, as the insulation. There's about six to seven tonnes of sand above, above this oven at the moment. So you can imagine we're a little bit sceptical getting in there to mortar and, and redo the floor with so much Sorry. Can you identify any of those fire bricks actually being made at clack line? I so I had a big uh, one for the fire bricks and all that. Yeah, I still have some of the, the remnants of them. Some I've kept some of them, so um, I, I can't actually identify. But um, I'd be interested if you you'd be able to look uh, look into that for me as I well. Think that's shut down. Now. That's shut down as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, there was two different styles of bricks in, in the floor which sort of surprised, surprised me. Um, one was more of a white, a white fire brick um, and they're about 30 by 30 so they're a good size paver. Uh, and there was also the, the red sort of clay, clay one. So um, the reason we had to redo the floor was it was that it had water damage over the years, mainly at the back area, a creeper or, or something had got in. Um, and had a bit of water damage and washed a bit of, bit of sand out. Uh, our, our other reason for, for removing the, the floor, I guess, was to be able to bake the traditional way, with no tins, no trays, bake it straight on the, on the half of the oven. Uh, it's, it's a method that doesn't get used all that much. It'd be, it would be the only oven in, in Perth that would bake bread using that method. So. We're pretty excited about that. Um, and getting back to um, the structure of it, um, so that you can see just at the top here, there's a little little door where they used to shovel the sand up up into the top and, and insulate it that way. 
Once the, that roof part is done, then they build the finished building external structure and, and finish the wall. Um, it's tied together by um, eight rods, um, two at four leading from front to back and four leading from um, the two sides. They're all tied in with these large metal bars here. Um, and that basically keeps the, the, the thing in structure, yeah, nice and safe. Um, as you'll see on the photo, there's a big crack near the, near the flue on this side. Um, the base of the chimney is on the left-hand side, your firebox is on the right-hand side. We light our fire in this one here. It lifts up over the top of the oven and then out our chimney on the, on the left-hand side. Um, there's many, there's probably three or four different methods of, of um, heating the one, heating these ovens. The, the modern ones nowadays have their fire on the floor in the centre here. Um, there's also a French um, style oven that has a firebox here, which to me is not all that smart because you're working right in front of that, that heat all, all day. So, but it's, it's definitely another, another method. Um, we're at the stage now where um, the whole oven doors uh, are just about restored back to as new as we can get them. Um, they've been cleaned up, um, wire brushed back and, and brought them back to a, a lot of the original metal. Um, all the paint has been taken off, so it's all back to the red, the traditional red style brick. Um, the mortar or the, the cement in the um, in between the, the bricks was, was very brittle and a lot of it had broken away um, over time. So what we've done is, is basically gouged all that out and, and repointed the whole, the whole face of the oven to give it a nice, a nice finish. Um, so the next steps for us today, um, the building, the, the, the oven room is, was clad with asbestos. We've had that removed um, and we're working on that room at the moment. Today I had my two brothers, um, both from Victoria, over helping uh, plaster that, that wall up. They're both bakers as well, so it's, it's ingrained in our family and, and I'm sure it will be for a, for a long time. Um, we plan to have two rooms. At the moment, the, the red room of the gallery is, is still being used uh, for the final exhibition, which is uh, probably a sad time for the, for the ladies, um, but also an exciting time for, for me as well. So um, once we finish this room, I think October 16, we, we plan to, to move into the next the next room. The reason we're having two rooms is to control the temperature of our, of our doughs. It's very important when we're making um, traditional sourdough breads that we, we control the temperature of that, of that dough and, and that bread. So what we plan to do is have all our dough making in our first room, which is the red room of the, uh, the gallery, and then our production room in, in the old bakery oven room. Uh, so what we wanted to, to encapsulate with our, uh, our concept is to, to make sure that it's not just locked up and, and people can't see it. I know um, Kath and Anna told me plenty of stories of people coming down to the, to the back of the, uh, the gallery and having a look at the oven and, and remembering the old times when you know, they've seen these ovens and, and stuff like that. So what we're hoping to do is have a... The Red Room has a, a quite a large window which you can actually view um, through to through to this room. So we plan to have a nice glass door in between the two rooms so we can seal off some of the heat, but we can also, um, people can still see the oven and see the baker working. So it's, it's something that, that's very unique, um, something that you, you, won't, you won't see in too many places and, and too many states. There's not many of these ovens left in, in WA and there's probably, as far as I know, four or five that I know of left in. Um, there's one in Miller's um, Museum in, in Bicton. New norsey has got a couple and I think there's a couple more around as well. So um, the opportunity for us is, was, was fantastic. Sorry, mate. Um, I just want to know, have you had any preference uh, type of wood you've uh, burned in the uh, Yeah, we're... Yeah, probably Jarrah. Obviously, it's probably the most high, the highest demand sort of sort of uh, uh, bread. But we we 
intend to, to play around with a little bit, maybe some sugar gum for a different product, or if that's if that's see me after. See me after. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, just like obviously the the flavour that you get from different woods, and obviously when we're smoking fish or, or, or something like that, but different uh, different smoke creates a different flavour. So we we do think that maybe for our, our deeper, darker sourdoughs, we might try our jarra and then maybe for some lighter stuff, some sugar gum or, or something like that. Um, wood supply, we're, we're looking at making it a, a, a sustainable sort of um, project. So we're having the, the modern side of it to, a, to an old twist. So um, obviously our, our wood is going to come from a sustainable forest. Our, um, our power is going to be green power. We're, we're trying to make a, a bit of a statement as well to say that, look, you know, to, to industry and, and to the, I guess, in a way, to government as well, that there's not many incentives for government, uh, for businesses to turn to solar power or, or green energy now. But two, three years ago, there was grants given out um, for converting to solar power or stuff like that. Now that's all, that's all changed at the moment. There's nothing available for any business to, um, in, in the way of grants to, to help, you know, or, or try and make a difference. Um, so, yeah, I think we're getting to, towards the end. Um, our bread's going to be sourdough, um, majority of sourdough, uh, traditional methods, taking up to 12 hours to make, make a loaf of bread, some 24 hours, uh, depending on, on the recipe and depending on the method. Um, our bread will be, be marketed uh, through, through the cafe through, and through the gallery, so please come down and buy it. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, everything, everything we've done, we're, we're really, really happy about We're so happy to get the opportunity and, and we thank the, the ladies so much for, for their input. They've been fantastic ever since the first day of helping, um, helping Emma, and my, Emma and myself on the way. Um, and what I'd like to do, guys, is I don't have a great deal of photos. Actually, I don't have any, but... Um, I do have it plenty at home, and, and what I would like to do is that once we are up, up and going, I would like to invite you guys down and come and have a look, um, come and have a look at our photos and, and stuff like that, and the process that we've taken to get it to where it is. So um, I'm sure I'll be in contact in the in the future. We plan to be up, fingers crossed, um, middle of no, November, um, up and active by then, um, if things if things go go the right way. So. Um, I'll, I'll be in contact in, in the near future and I'd love you to come down and have a look and, and see what we've done. So. That was fantastic. Can I invite you back up? Folks, that, I'm sure you all agree. That, that was the most enlightening talk. And it's so, like this group are really wrapped in, in the history of Maylands, the old buildings, and this talk tonight has just been fantastic. And we wish you all the very best, Andrew, because, you know, something like that is, is so unique, it will be fantastic for Maylands, and I'm sure you will get the support of our group, who, uh, who just love old things anyway. I'd <laughs> uh, love to see that, uh, that uh, yeah. oven working. And it really is. Oh, I'm terribly impressed. Now, Kat, we'd like to make a small presentation to you. Can I just say, when Andrew came in to see us that day after the blue, we were really delighted. And it's been great working with him. Um, we're able, hopefully, to keep on working with him and in, in integrating the gallery, the cafe, and the bakery all together. And it, I think one of the nice things is that it, it increases the amount of community involvement in, for, the, for that building. It's had a good history of community involvement, and I think it's going to continue. So it's just great. Absolutely. Wonderful. Kat, thank you very much. You <laughs> so, all to know, in that building, Kath and Anne run a gallery and a gift shop that uh, there's some wonderful gifts in there. So please, uh, if you were uh, looking for something, not only go uh, and look at Andrew baking bread, but have a look at the gift shop and the gallery as well, and the cafe, of course, that all runs uh, in conjunction. 
So thank you so much. Yeah, and Andrew, I don't know whether you like wine or whether you like chocolates. I don't mind. Or I don't mind. You, you tell me. Because we've got a little bag of You put it in the wrap of the wine. No. We have a white wine or red wine or a box of chocolates. Um, you know what? Just, I think leave it in the wrap I'm happy with that. So, thank you. Well, thank you. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.